I'm actually surprised, quite frankly, in the patients that I see with inherited TTR amyloidosis, how few have actually seen a genetic counselor knowing the inheritance pattern of this disease and knowing that there are children, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins that could be involved and no one's gotten testing kits which actually are free at this point in time. And I personally think it's essential that every patient with inherited TTR amyloidosis see a genetic counselor. And so we're fortunate to have Ms. Emily Brown, who's a genetic counselor at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. She works in the Center for Inherited Heart Disease and talk about her very important role in amyloid. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Gertz, and thank you. Let me see if I can, there we go. Uh, Muriel for that invitation to come speak this morning to everyone about the importance of thinking through the genetics and that role that might be playing for you and your family. So I wanted to start out just by taking you back to probably high school biology course. You might recall that we, in our cells, we all have our DNA, which is made up of our genes. And the genes are like the instruction manual for the body. They tell us how tall we are, what color hair we have, and they also tell the body how to form and how to work. Building upon this analogy, I like to think of genes as an instruction manual, and each gene is an individual sentence within that manual. And so a spelling mistake, like a change in a letter or a missing word, can make that sentence no longer make sense, and as a result, it's a mutation, and this can lead to different health conditions, such as TTR amyloidosis. We all have two copies of the TTR gene. You get one from your mom and one from your dad. Most people have two working copies, and that's actually the case with wild-type TTR. So wild type's not thought to be genetic, at least as far as we know, and when you do genetic testing for the TTR gene, no mutations are found. On the other hand, with the hereditary form, there's a mutation in at least one of those two copies. This causes the protein to misfold and lead to the amyloid deposition. And this is what we mean when we say amyloidosis is an autosomal dominant condition. It means there's a change or a mutation in one of those two copies. Over 120 different mutations within the gene have been reported. And this is just a schematic of that gene. I know it looks like alphabet soup. Um, but the important thing to know is that there are lots of different mutations and actually knowing the specific mutation running in your family is beneficial. Um, okay. So genetic testing is important, one, just to differentiate between wild type and hereditary. If you just have the PYP scan, that's not going to tell us which form you have. If you've had a cardiac biopsy or another biopsy, usually it gets sent out for mass spec, but that tissue testing doesn't always pick up the mutations. And so genetic testing is the most definitive way to know the different subtype, and that's helpful as the um, physicians have presented in thinking about different treatment options. But knowing the specific mutation is also helpful because it can tell us what symptoms you might be likely to develop or experience. Certain mutations, like the V122i, are very commonly seen with the cardiac symptoms and buildup of amyloid in the heart, while other mutations, like VAL30-MET, are more likely to be seen with neuropathy and the amyloid building up around the nerves and in the nerves. Um, and then you have some that are in the middle. And so this allows us to also refer you to the correct specialists um, and give anticipatory guidance. Of course, Another important part of the genetics is the familial risk. Uh, and so if we know you have the genetic form, what's the likelihood other family members will also carry that mutation and develop HATTR? The specific mutation provides us information on what age other family members might be likely to develop signs and symptoms, and the likelihood they will. This is called penetrance. Um, and 
Not everyone who carries a mutation in the gene will actually go on to develop the condition, and the likelihood depends at least partially on the specific mutation, uh, and it also allows for reproductive planning. I wanted to just take a quick detour and note that there are two different no naming systems, what we call nomenclature, and actually you'll see this on your name tags. So historically, we didn't include 20 building blocks of the gene or the protein called amino acids, and so the historical name is missing those 20. And then the official lab grade name, or what we call the Human Genome Organization's recommendation, includes those 20 amino acids. And as a result, you'll see on the lab report or um, in literature that the mutation is listed as 20 more. Okay. Um, so sometimes it can be confusing, but know that V122I is the same as V142I, same like 3 and 60 alanine is the same as threonine and 80 alanine. Okay. So going back to the inheritance, because amyloidosis is dominant, this means all first degree relatives, so your kids, siblings, parents, have a 50% chance to carry that mutation and either have or develop amyloidosis. This gene's not on one of the sex chromosomes, so it's not related to if you're male or female, both are at, genders are at risk. Um, and a common question I have been asked is, you know, if my child tests negative, what about their kids, my grandkids, are they at risk? And the answer is no. So the condition doesn't skip generations like that. Um, so if your kids test negative, you don't have to worry about the grandkids. Okay. A big piece of my job is to talk through how best to share this information with your relatives and family members. And there's not one perfect approach. It really depends on each individual family. And you guys are the experts in that. You know your family the best. Um, but there's different strategies that you can think of. And my favorite way to start about thinking about this is to think about how your family has shared information in the past. Have there been other health diagnoses like cancer or Alzheimer's that have been discussed in the family? Um, or just other major life events. For some families, there's one person that's kind of the news spreader. They talk to everyone, and if you tell that person, they'll make sure everyone knows. Um, for other people or other families, maybe they all get together Sundays for dinner, or you get together for the holidays. Is that a good time to talk in person? And I know, you know, not all families, we have perfect relationships with all of our relatives. That's so common. Um, and sometimes it's easiest to email or send a letter. And we have worked with Muriel and our team to draft a letter. It's on the website, if you didn't get one last night, um, of, that you can use as a template to help share this information. And once you share that information with your relatives, they're going to all in, take it in differently and weigh whether they want to get genetic testing or not. It's a very personal decision. It depends on a lot of different factors. It might depend on their stage of life. Are they in their 20s and not likely to develop the condition for a few decades? Are they thinking about having kids and want to know for that reason? Are they starting to have symptoms and want to be proactive? Um, and there's some people from a personality standpoint, some people really just want to know one way or the other. It's more anxiety provoking to not know. Um, and other people, the thought of kind of having this thought of, is this going to develop in me, is more anxiety provoking if they have that positive test result. A very important piece to think about before doing the predictive testing is this idea of insurance discrimination. So there is a law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, uh, or GINA, that protects against health insurances and em most employers from using genetic test results to either deny you health care coverage or raise your rates, deny employment. There's some exemptions to that, like the military or small employers with less than 15 people. Um, but importantly, this law does not include life insurance or long-term care insurance. So those companies are legally able to ask 
if you're going to apply for a new policy, whether you've done genetic testing and use that information to determine coverage. Um, for this reason, sometimes families will go ahead and get life insurance first and then do the testing. You don't have to disclose it if you haven't done it yet. Um, some people will get life insurance through their jobs. You know, the caveat with that is if you change jobs, the next company might not have life insurance or um, might have a different program. And some people decide they don't want to do the testing because of this risk, and in that case, it's good to be screening and thinking about the setting of uh, onset of symptoms. I wanted to try to liven up my presentation by talking about a fictional family and how they might respond to this information. So given that we're right around Halloween, um, I did this with the Adams family, okay? <laughs> So in this example, grandmama has tested positive for amyloidosis, and she decides she's going to share this very appropriately with her son, Gomez, and her nephew, Cousin It. Gomez is kind of just living in the moment. He's not too concerned, but he tells his wife, Morticia, and Morticia's very concerned. She's worried about him, but also their two kids, and so she really wants him to get tested. Um, and so he decides he's going to listen to his wife, which is always wise, um, and gets tested. Now, Cousin It is in a different kind of life stage. He doesn't have kids. He doesn't have a wife. But he does have really nice hair, right? <laughs> and he's really concerned about not being able to comb his hair, that neuropathy progressing. So he wants to be on top of it. If there's any predict proactive medications that come out in the next few years, he wants to be able to get that. So he tests, and he tests actually negative. Um, now in about 20 years, Gomez and Morticia decide to tell their kids and talk to them about genetic testing. They don't test them right away because we don't recommend testing children. Um, this is an adult onset condition, and so um, once they get a little bit older, they talk to Wednesday. Wednesday is very defiant, and she doesn't go to doctors. She doesn't like them, so she just decides she's not going to test. And I think a lot of us can relate to that, um, having family members that don't like doctors. Uh, and Pugsley has a different approach. He's been concerned and thinking about getting life insurance for a while. Wednesday has been trying to blow him up for a long time. Um, <laughs> So he decides first to get life insurance, and then he does testing, and he tests negative. Um, now, obviously, this is a somewhat silly example, but what I wanted to show is just there can be a wide variety of reactions to the same information, and people will choose different choices depending on where they are in their life and their personalities. Um, now, a genetic counselor is someone that can help your family and yourself navigate this information. They're typically master level professionals with training in both genetics and counseling. And we're much more than just the person that fills out the test form. Our goal is really to help you understand the genetic results and what that means for you and your family. You can see a genetic counselor at any point. Um, in an ideal world, I would love it if people got to see genetic counselors before doing the genetic testing and after, but I know that's not always the reality. And so even if you've already had the testing done, if you have questions about what that means or how to interpret the results, the results themselves are very dense and hard to understand for patients, um, that's a great time to see someone. Or if you're thinking about having kids and wanting to talk through prenatal testing options or what the risk is, also a wonderful time. So really, at any point, you can see a genetic counselor. I put this slide in because I get this question all the time. But the good news, as Dr. Gertz mentioned, is that there are two programs that cover the cost of genetic testing and genetic counseling sponsored by two of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, but if you want to go through your insurance, most commercial insurances are going to cover genetic counseling. Um, and the genetic testing, but it is very insurance specific, and so it's something to talk about with the center you're going to. Okay. If you want to find a genetic counselor and aren't sure where to start, the National Society of Genetic Counselors has a website called Find a Genetic Counselor 
at .nsgc.org. And the nice thing is you can search by if you want to see someone in person or if you want to see them by telehealth. One benefit of COVID was that so many GCs now have telehealth appointments. Um, and you can also start with your regional amyloidosis centers. They may have someone on staff or know someone to refer to. And you can always email me as well. My email's there. Um, and I know some genetic counselors across the country that work in this field and would love to meet with you. Thank you, and then questions will be for the breakout.